Here we go. Pont du Gard. This is a uh, structure located in the south of France. It's part of a 31 mile system of aqueducts, um, including several bridges, this being the largest. And it was constructed about the first century AD. No simple task by any stretch. The purpose of the structure was to bring clean water from some springs that were located about 11 miles away as the crow flies to the town of Nimes in south of France. Now, water is essential. You know, humans can live three, maybe four days without water, but undergoing this type of effort to bring water to a location is certainly not typical. Most of mankind located near water rather than bring it to them. Most population settlements developed around clean water. <clears throat> but in addition to survival, water has a lot of uses. Let's talk about household consumption first. Drinking, cooking, bathing, laundry, flushing. EPA has estimated that um, about 80 to 100 gallons of water per day per person are used for these household activities. Now what happens to that 80 to 100 gallons per day that's being used? Once it's used, it turns into waste. <clears throat> Another use of water that's been around since man's been around has been for waste disposal. Rivers used to carry waste away from the settlement. You take your clean water in from upstream and you put your dirty water in downstream. Um, one of the classic examples is the city of Chicago. In the late 1800s, um, the city was experiencing some severe outbreaks of waterborne illness. The reason they concluded was that they dumped their sewage into the Chicago River. The Chicago River flowed into Lake Michigan. The city gets its drinking water from Lake Michigan. Their solution to this problem was an engineering solution. They reversed the flow of the Chicago River. So it no longer flowed into Lake Michigan and now flowed away from Lake Michigan. They still use the river to dispose of their sewage, but they were sending it in a different direction. So no longer going to Lake Michigan, now it was going to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and with that, wastewater treatment technologies have also evolved over time. Um, <clears throat> starting with nothing and just allowing the, the streams or the rivers that receive the waste to carry it away. They, they, there was some dilution effects. There was some attenuation. You know, rivers, moving rivers um, can attenuate waste. Um, the next step was to go to primary treatment where they settled out solid materials, but still relied on the river's natural capacity to attenuate or assimilate waste to deal with, with um, the, the dissolved materials, not the solids materials. Again, that wasn't sufficient. They then advanced to secondary treatment, which uh, there's a whole range of sec types of secondary treatment. Um, the more effective ones are the ones that are currently in place, probably nationwide. Um, they do a good job, again, removing all the solids, but then also reducing the, the oxygen demanding waste and chemical waste that are also found in water. Um, and again, that's probably what most treatment plants around the country are doing. That's what the Green Lake Sanitary District does, and that's also what uh, the Green Lake Water Department has secondary treatment. If that's not sufficient, if the water, if the receiving water that's sitting this treated wastewater still doesn't have the capacity to deal with it, there's a higher level of treatment, tertiary treatment. And I believe that's what the city of Ripon is employing. But as you might expect, to move along this process to the more higher levels of treatment, the costs go way up. <clears throat> the cost of construction and certainly the cost of operation and maintenance increase dramatically as you move up to tertiary treatment. And the cost increase can be so significant that municipalities that might be faced with having to advance their treatment to tertiary treatment to deal with nutrients are looking at alternative ways to achieve those standards or to, to meet that requirement. <clears throat> okay, in addition to the household consumption use and the use of rivers for waste disposal. There's a whole bunch of other uses for water. Transportation, you know, cargo and passengers. Uh, transportation is probably the water use that have resulted in more invasive species entering our country. Um, 
agricultural use for irrigation, um, food source, you know, fishing, commercial fishing, individual fishing. Uh, most manufacturing processes use water either as process makeup water or for cooling water and power generation is a huge use of water. Um, I was doing some training for the Gila River Indian community down in Phoenix, Arizona, and I did some research and it was a Department of, uh, Department of Energy study which said that the, uh, <clears throat> the process of producing energy uses more water than any other industry or enterprise. And the process of supplying water, distribution, treatment before use, treatment after use, consumes more energy than any other enterprise. And the conclusion from that was that when you conserve energy, you're also conserving water. And when you conserve water, you're also conserving energy, more bang for your buck, if you will. But there's still another important use. And if we were, if I could be there as a group and we were doing this in public or in person, I would probably ask somebody, well, okay, what is the other big primary use of water? Well, the answer is recreation. And these terms fishable and swimmable have very specific meanings. And I want you to remember those terms because um, I will come back to them later. But again, recreation is a major, major significant use that mankind uh, does with water. Okay, I want to move a little bit into the science of pollution. Um, hydrology and watersheds, how water moves and eutrophication, the biological aging of, of uh, water bodies. Uh, I mean, that doesn't show up. I know how to get rid of people, Rich, on the, my screen. Can, move, can I move them all over somewhere? Uh, I can't get them off all the way. All right, let me start with something. I call this the pollution equation. Um, <clears throat> in order to have an environmental water pollution problem, you have to have all three components. You need to have sources of pollution, like contaminated you know, soils, wastewater discharges, leaking underground tank. The pollution needs a way that it can migrate. There needs to be some path of migration, whether it's a stream or through the air, groundwater, runoff, erosion, some way for the pollutants to move from the source along a path until they reach a receptor, something that can actually be harmed by the pollution. Um, <clears throat> if one of those pieces is missing, you don't have an environmental problem. But it's important to understand each of those parts of the equation, if you will. Um, understanding the sources of the pollutant, what can be done about it? Can it be treated? Can those sources be removed? Can they somehow be contained? How do they move? What does that migration pathway look like? Can you do something to the pathway? Can you modify it so that the pollutants don't arrive at the receptor? Look at the receptor. Now, if this was a toxic waste issue where you had toxic pollutants that were migrating through groundwater to somebody's private well, one of the options is to move the receptor. That's what happened to Love Canal. They moved people out of the, out of the contamination area. But when that water, when that receptor is a water body like a lake, it can't move it. So you'd look at what can you do with that water body to mitigate th those impacts? There's, water bodies have the capacity to cleanse themselves. Is there something you can do to help that capacity to help that water body cleanse itself of pollutants? <clears throat> okay. This is a simple diagram of a watershed. Um, and the concept of a watershed is actually quite simple. Water flows downhill to a common point where it ultimately leaves that watershed and joins another. It doesn't matter how the water enters a watershed, whether it's precipitation or discharge from a pipe or an intermittent stream that has, when the groundwater level is high because of a wet spring, now that stream is flowing, or if somebody's watering their lawn. It doesn't matter how the water gets there, but water flows downhill and any water in that watershed is going to flow down to a common point. This is a, little more complex watershed than that simple illustration. This is the Mississippi River Basin, her watershed. It collects and drains water from a little over 40% of the surface area of the continental United States. Um, it flows down to the Gulf of Mexico where it leaves the watershed. Um, a drop of water entering anywhere 
in this watershed, you know, way up here, is ultimately going to find its way to the Gulf of Mexico. And imagine what that drop of water may pick up along the way in terms of sources of pollution throughout an area like that. Now, when you look at a river system like this, it, it's, it's easy to visualize rivers because they flow. Um, a drop of water entering the Mississippi up at the headwaters and working its way down to the Gulf of Mexico, the water's flowing about two to three miles an hour and it'll take about mm, three months for that water to arrive at the Gulf. But lakes also flow. Uh, this is the Great Lakes watershed, Great Lakes Basin. Um, the lakes flow if they have an outlet. Um, for Lake Michigan, this flow takes about 60 years for the water to flow out of the lake. Lake Huron, it's about 20 years. Lake Erie, three to four years. Um, I read where that if a, a drop of water entering Lake Superior in 1826 would just now be leaving Lake Superior. Um, <clears throat> Any drop of water that falls into this Great Lakes watershed is eventually going to discharge at its outlet, which is the St. Lawrence River, and empty into the Atlantic Ocean. Now, if you look at this little bump here, I'm drawing the arrow around in Wisconsin of the Great Lakes watershed, and we go back and look at this little bump here with the Mississippi River watershed, that's the town of Portage. That's where the Fox River, which flows north into the Great Lakes watershed, and the Wisconsin River, which flows south into the Mississippi watershed, are about two miles apart. So there's theoretically, there's a spot there that if you poured water out of your left hand, it would go to the Mississippi. If you poured it out of your right, it would wind up in the St. Lawrence Seaway, Atlantic Ocean, Gulf of Mexico. That's the watersheds are like. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, the, the, oh, the other point I wanted to make about lakes, that they do flow, water's there for a long time, they flow very slow. That means if dirty water gets into the lake, it stays there for a long time. Okay, let's talk about eutrophication or the process of how lakes age. Um, eutrophication is basically the intersection of chemistry, physics, and biology. Chemistry, I'm talking about nutrients. Phosphorus and nitrogen are chemicals, so is dissolved oxygen. Those are the chemical parts of the process. Physics comes into play, wind and wave action, and gravity, settling. The other part, biology, is the growth of plants, phytoplankton, algae, aquatic weeds, et cetera, and their life cycle, which includes those dying off and decomposing and consuming oxygen as they decompose. So what does this look like? Um, if you have runoff, or sewage that contains nutrients entering a lake. It allows algae and weeds to grow. When those weeds die off, that algae dies off, it sinks down to the bottom and decomposes, decays, and that process consumes oxygen. That's sort of a natural process. The more nutrients you have entering in, the more algae, more weeds grow, the more die off, settle down, and consume more and more oxygen. Eutrophication process is an overabundance of nutrients, an overabundance of growth and death and decomposition that continues to move up and overtake this water body. Um, there are four stages of eutrophication. Um, they're called the trophic states. The oligotrophic state is where you have a very, very low amount of nutrients in the water, so you don't have a lot of algae or weed growth and you have very high clarity. It's very high quality water. As more nutrients get into the lake, there's more productivity, more weeds. Um, it's called a mesotrophic state. Eutrophic state is when you have a high volume of nutrients in the water, high productivity, lots of weeds, low oxygen, um, very different types of fish species surviving. And then there's this last one, is it called a hypereutrophic state? or you could call it a dead state, or you could call it a swamp. Um, <clears throat> this is a natural process. Um, the ligotrophic lake will get nutrients in it, could get nutrients from leaves falling into it, other debris, um, waterfowl depositing into it. So it gets nutrients in it. And if those nutrients that it's receiving are more than the lake can handle, you'll start getting more productivity and you'll become a mesotrophic lake. 
and that process can continue. In nature, that process can take thousands of years if it even happens. If it's a lake that can handle that little bit of nutrient coming in, it'll stay elatotrophic or it'll stay mesotrophic. When you introduce man's impact, <clears throat> this process can take decades. So when I'm referring to human impact or human activities, I'm talking about the cumulative effect of a lot of those activities. Okay, I'm gonna move you all back over here. <clears throat> this is the Mississippi River Basin again, outlined on this map. I'm gonna talk about cumulative impact. I'm talking about stormwater runoff from Helena, Montana, which is way up here from their urban environment. You know, runoff that flows through the streets and the uh, parking lots and things like that. And the tens of thousands of communities throughout this watershed with that same issue. I'm talking about soil erosion from individual farms of the 500 million acres of farmland that's located in this watershed. You know, this is where the farm belt is. I'm talking about industrial discharges like the fertilizer facility in Lawrence, Kansas and their discharge, but thousands of other industry sources all discharging into the streams in this watershed. All those municipal waste discharges from the big cities, Cincinnati, Chicago, St. Louis, Minneapolis, and all the small municipalities discharging that's a lot of stuff coming down. Add to that the basic yard waste from people's homes, you know, hundreds of thousands of homes, uh, cutting you know, grass clippings, raking leaves, runoff from their, from their yards, and doggy wastes. Now, I'm gonna have to move you over again for this next slide. <clears throat> One of our board members saw this, saw this sign. This is signed in Tampa Bay area and <clears throat> the statistics are kind of amazing. They, they estimated there's about 500,000 dogs in the Tampa Bay region. The average dog produces about half a pound of waste per day. That's 125 tons. They've also estimated that about 40% of the people don't pick up after their dogs. That means there's 50 tons of dog waste left on the ground every day. Now, when it rains, where does that dog waste go? It goes into the storm sewers, it goes into the drainage ditches, it goes into the creeks, the streams, the rivers, eventually the Gulf of Mexico. And when you have that, all that cumulative effect of all those different sources, all coming down to the point entering into the Gulf of Mexico, you wind up with this thing called the dead zone. And I would encourage people to just Google dead zone Gulf of Mexico, it's, it's fascinating to read about. There is an area there because of the nutrients coming in and the, the process of plants growing and dying and oxygen being consumed, there's a dead zone that on average is about 5,000 square miles. It's been as large as 8,000 square miles. And when I say dead zone, I'm talking about an area that's completely avoided by creatures that can move like fish, shrimp, et cetera. But for those that can't move, they die. And it's amazing, this, this is caused by that cumulative effect of all those sources in the broad Mississippi River Basin coming down to one point. <clears throat> Green Bay has a dead zone from all the nutrients coming up from the Fox River. Very, very low dissolved oxygen. Green Lake has a dead zone too. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. <clears throat> okay, now I want to talk about the cumulative impact from collective action. If Helena, Montana has a nice stormwater management program, stormwater pollution prevention plan that they're implementing, and all those other communities that have stormwater runoff have those types of plans and they're implementing those plans. If the farmers on individual plans are installing best management practices to reduce erosion, if all those industrial dischargers have more advanced waste treatment, if the cities the discharge have more advanced waste treatment. If those millions of people, millions of homes are managing their yard waste responsibly, and if those doggy waste are being picked up, the cumulative impact from all that collective action can be very positive. <clears throat> I actually referred to picking up dog waste as more of a collection action. That's, that's for another time. Um, <clears throat> the, the problem with this, this concept of cumulative 
impact from collective action is that it requires individuals very often to do things. And <clears throat> I would say I was sometimes, but maybe most of the time, we need laws or regulations or ordinances to promote this type of positive action. It, it's difficult to overcome this, this individualistic attitude that how does my individual yard waste or how does my picking up after my dog make an impact? You know, what, what's that gonna do? You know, I, that doesn't hurt anything. It's only my dog's waste. It's only my yard's runoff or, you know, I, just fertilizing my yard doesn't hurt anything. And so it's to overcome that individualistic, you need laws and regulations. <clears throat> and so because of discharges like this into the rivers, because of scenes like this, this is the Cuyahoga River emptying into Lake Erie around the late 1960s when the river caught fire. This is someone trying to engage in one of those recreation activities, fishing on an algae covered pond because of too much nutrient pollution. This is why laws came about. And the first law had to deal with parties dumping waste into waterways that was impacting navigation. So the first environmental law in the United States, the Rivers and Harbors Act of 1899, administered by the US Army Corps of Engineers, and it was to deal with navigation issues. It required permits for somebody who wanted to dump something into a waterway that was nav navigable waterway. In 1948, as a result of population growth and all those communities um, using the rivers to dispose of their sewage, it's having a downstream adverse effect, uh, which is no surprise. You know, if you take your water from upstream and it's clean and then you use it and discharge it downstream, you're good. But the party downstream isn't so good. And so the Federal Water Pollution Control Act was passed. It was administered by the Public Health Service and its focus was human health and uh, an aggressive program for sewage treatment plant construction around the country. And then Clean Water Act in 1972, um, came about because of situations like the Cuyahoga River. Uh, Earth Day, April 1970, EPA was formed in December of 1970. Um, this law was initially administered by US EPA. Uh, it's a law that I was very much involved in when I was at EPA. It's directed primarily at point sources of pollution, those, those discharges coming out of pipes. And the program was a permitting program that said, here's your permit for your discharge and the permit limits what you can discharge. And if you don't meet those limits, you're gonna be subject to very aggressive and rigorous enforcement. So that was the Clean Water Act. <clears throat> Some amendments in 1987, let me, oops, let me grab the people and move them over here. <coughs> it was more of a partnership, a, a legislation driving partnership between EPA and the states to also address not just point sources, but water pollution from non-point sources, runoff type things. And they were encouraging watershed-based approaches to dealing with pollution, not so much just the individual point sources. And they were pushing states to adopt this type of a watershed-based approach. Wisconsin had been doing that years before that. So th this was nothing new to the state of Wisconsin. That law resulted in the promulgation of some regulations at the federal level for the TMDL program, Total Maximum Daily Load Program, 1992. And that was an attempt to put structure to this effort of uh, federal, state, and local partnership <clears throat> to deal with water pollution, addressing all those cumulative, the cumulative impact of all of those sources that talked about. It. So the you know, federal government isn't going to regulate doggy waste pickup or yard wastes. They don't even regulate agricultural runoff from farmlands. So this is the partnership between federal, state, and local or organizations to deal with the whole broad range of, of pollution sources. <clears throat> so how does that work? Uh, it starts with establishing water quality standards that will be designed to achieve a fishable, swimmable environment. What, what can the water have in it and still be good use of recreation, fishable and swimmable water? Then you monitor and assess the water body. And if it's meeting those standards, great, you continue to monitor. If it doesn't meet those standards, then it goes on a list as being impaired. That, that listing says, what is the impairment and what causes the impairment? And once it's listed as impaired, the regulations and law require that a total maximum daily loading program be developed. And it, that program tells 
all the point sources in a watershed, how much waste they can discharge. It looks at the non-point sources in the watershed and said, this is how much waste can come off of all those non-point sources to achieve our goal. And then there's also a margin of safety because a lot of this is developed through assumptions and modeling, not, not always direct measurements. And then you implement it and make adjustments as necessary. Okay, I wanna go back, just again, brief summary of the history of environmental laws and programs. The Clean Water Act's goal is to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's water. Restore and maintain. Restore because water, the water bodies have been harmed already. We wanna restore them back to a more desired state. And when we get them there, we wanna maintain them with a goal of fishable and swimmable use, recreation. I was explaining this to Rich last night and he said, well, isn't drinking water a more important, more higher use? And my response was, there isn't a surface water body in the United States, probably in the world, that doesn't have to treat water from surface water before it can be used to drink. So you're not going to achieve, ever achieve that type of a standard where you can drink it directly out of the lake without treatment. The goal of the Clean Water Act is so the water can be used for recreation, fishable and swimmable use. Okay, that's sort of the halfway point of the presentation. From this point on, I'm gonna bring all that laws, regulations, science into the context of Green Lake. And we're gonna start with history. Um, I'm not gonna go back as far as the formation of Green Lake, you know, 10,000 years ago. I'm gonna start more when uh, people started settling around the lake. We'll go back to 1845 when Anson Richard Dart built a dam to harness power. Their use of the lake was for energy. Um, in the 1850s, the lake was evolving as a desirable location. I've heard it's the oldest resort west of Niagara Falls. Um, it was being used for recreation. It was also being used for waste disposal. People were disposing of the waste directly in the lake, their, their sewage. Um, 1885, Asian carp was introduced into the lake using the lake as a food source. How well did that work out? Um, in 1900s, Lawson raised the dam another couple of feet for recreation purposes. Development around the lake shore is continuing and the lake is being used for recreation and waste disposal. Um, even when septic tanks started coming into use, septic tanks, eventually the water flows out of the septic tank. And if it's in the watershed and flows downhill, it's ultimately gonna to get to the lake. Um, oops, pardon me. <clears throat> After World War II, uh, with, with the advancement of chemical fertilizers, a lot of the development occurred in the agricultural community. A lot more farming was going on around the lake, but development around the lake shore continued to accelerate, again, recreation and waste disposal as the use of the lake. And human impact on the water quality started to become evident. What wasn't so noticeable was the, the real impact of these dams that were formed or the dam that was raised initially and then elevated again later on. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, <clears throat> this shaded area off to the right is the watershed of Silver Creek and Dayton Creeks combined that flow into the Silver Creek estuary. Now, prior to the lake levels being raised, this estuary, the circle I have over here, was a wetlands, uh, a good functioning wetlands. And wetlands are, are nature's way of dealing with pollution. They filter out pollution. And when you flood the wetland, it loses that capacity. So by raising the water level, this wetlands area here lost the capacity to be a filter of pollution. Now you have this area down here in the Southwest corner where Spring, Roy and Wurches Creek empty into the County K Marsh. Same thing happened there. The County K Marsh was a wetlands, a wetland that had the capacity to filter out pollution from the watershed. That capacity was lost when the water level was raised that five feet. Go up to this circle, if I got my arrow. There it is, Byers Cove. Imagine what Byers Cove would look like without five feet of water in it. It would probably look like a marsh, a wetlands area, cattails and the whole bit. I'm trying to imagine what the terrace would look like over by Riley's. If water level was down five feet, your piers would be 
that would too be a, would also be a marshy area. So all all this natural defense mechanisms for the lake to filter out pollution were significantly impaired, impacted by raising the water level. In addition, all the development around the lake shore, you know, cutting down the trees, removing the vegetation, um, it also filters out the pollutants. Um, manicured lawns running right down to the water with, you know, being fertilized. All of those things had huge impacts. Um, primarily because of settlement around the lake, but huge, huge cause was raising the level of the lakes, impacting these defense mechanisms, if you will. Those defense mechanisms, the watersheds, the, the, uh, the wetlands areas, that's what's referred to as the eco-resiliency of, of the lake. What is out in the ecosystem that can protect the lake? What is the eco-resiliency of the lake when it doesn't have those, those wetlands to protect it, it, it's significantly impaired. And so we want to look at ways to improve not just the quality of the lake, but the eco-resiliency of the watershed as well. Okay, uh, gonna move the people again a little bit. Um, but in 51, you know, it's, it's, this is the 70th anniversary of the Green Lake Association. People started becoming aware and concerned about what was going on in the lake. Uh, sanitary district was formed. The DNR um, started looking at watershed-based approaches and Green Lake was one of the first ones they looked at. They got very much involved in trying to understand what was going on in Green Lake, doing studies around there. Uh, the county conservation departments um, expanded roles or more defined roles to deal with soil erosion and its impacts on water quality, not just lost agricultural land. Um, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that one I'm gonna to jump to 2011 where the lake management planning team was formed. And the first thing that they worked on was to develop a lake management plan for Green Lake that was approved by the DNR in 2013. And that established the initial program for dealing with water pollution in Green Lake. In 2014, because of concentrations, low dissolved oxygen concentrations, Green Lake was listed as impaired by the DNR. Okay, let's look at a little bit of the hydrology of Green Lake. Um, it, the watershed Green Lake encompasses 107 square miles. It's got eight main streams, each with their own subwatershed, numerous unnamed and intermittent streams, over 140 miles of them in total. So if you picture this, if you look at that, uh, recall that picture of the Great Lakes Basin with, with all those little streams and rivers, same thing is going on here in Green Lake watershed. There's three streams that have a direct discharge to the lake. That's Hill Creek, White Creek, and Assembly Creek over in the conference center. Um, two discharged, as I said before, through the Silver Creek estuary over on the east end of the lake. That's Silver Creek and Dakin Creek. And then there's three creeks that enter into the marsh, the County K Marsh, before going into the lake, uh, Wirches, Roy, and Spring Creeks. Green Lake also flows. It has an outlet. The, you know, going over the dam into the Pukian River, which then flows up to the Fox River, which then goes into Green Bay, which adds to that dead zone up in Green Bay. <clears throat> now, when we talk about the flow of Green Lake, um, you probably heard, if you've been to some of the presentations, that uh, it takes about 20 years for the water to flow through Green Lake. That's similar to what Lake Huron is like, which is a great lake. Green Lake's a pretty great lake too, but it's not nearly the same size. But 20 years is, is a significant amount of time. Now, that doesn't mean that, it, that any water entering Green Lake is going to be there for 20 years, because when it rains in the mill pond, that water isn't there for 20 years. It goes over the dam pretty quickly. And water coming under the county, K, county, uh, excuse me, county A bridge, which is closer to the outlet, that water is not there for 20 years. When they say 20 years, it's an average, and it's basically saying how long will it take for the lake to empty out completely at the rate it's going out over the dam. And so that's where you get this 20-year this range. The bottom line is it's a long time. That water coming into the lake is gonna be there for quite a while. If that water is dirty, you're gonna have dirty water in the lake for a long time. It's not like a river or a shallow lake. It's more like a great lake. Um, in that uh, pollution equation that I showed before, Green Lake is the receptor. And it's receiving excess of nutrient loading from a wide variety of sources. And we've categorized them three different categories, controllable sources, 
things like runoff from agricultural land, runoff from urban areas, wastewater discharges, uh, stream bank erosion, shoreline erosion. These are, these are sources of nutrients to the lake that can be controlled. There are uncontrollable sources. Quite a bit of phosphorus enters Green Lake from air deposition. You might wonder about, well, how does that come about? Well, if you look at all the farmland in the country, when there's dust in the air and it rains, that rain carries that dust down and that dust coming from farmland contains phosphorus. So Green Lake receives, you know, not quite 2,000 pounds a year of phosphorus from air deposition. It's a significant, significant source. There's also natural sources like waterfowl. And someone mentioned, what about uh, um, <clears throat> seagulls? Well, yeah, seagulls, if they leave their deposits in the lake, they're adding nutrients to the lake. The most prominent source of phosphorus loading to the lake comes from geese. They've done studies and they're looking at maybe 1,200 pounds a year of phosphorus entering the lake from goose droppings. And that's probably increasing, you know, the, the more there's, the water's open, you know, less ice, the more time the geese hang around. So all you gotta do is take a look at the lake in uh, late December before it's frozen over, you can see thousands of geese on the lake. They're all leaving something behind. Um, those are uncontrollable sources, but there are also sources that we don't quite understand yet, like phosphorus that's in the internal sediments of the lake. Phosphorus has been coming into the lake for you know, hundreds of years. It doesn't all leave the lake over the dam into the Pukian River. Some of it stays in the sediments. How is that impacting the water quality? That's still somewhat of an unknown to be studied. Uh, we also haven't really looked at groundwater. You know, groundwater flowing into the lake, does that carry phosphorus with it as well? So there's we know a lot about some sources. We know that there's some sources we can't control. And we know some things that we still need to, to understand. They all contribute to the excess of nutrient loading to Green Lake. Um, <clears throat> one of the questions was, where is Green Lake on that trophic state? Well, Green Lake was an oligotrophic lake. Green Lake now is a mesotrophic lake. It's moving down this direction from oligotrophic it's moving in the wrong direction. The thing is, is that we can change the direction that's moving. If you reduce the loading of nutrients, the lake can recover and go back to an oligotrophic state. And that is the objective of the plans that are being developed. That's the objective of that lake management planning team is to stop this trend, level it off, reverse it. So it's going back to an oligotrophic state till we get to that state and then make sure we've done the things to preserve it and maintain it at that level. <clears throat> what does that mean to Green Lake in terms of laws and regulations? Well, Green Lake has increasing issues with recreation, and that is a standard. This, that's the standard for Green Lake is to be able to be a recreational source, fishable, swimmable. Um, we have aesthetic issues due to that nutrient loading, excessive algae growth, excessive weed growth, Occasionally, more, I guess the last couple of years, there's been more cases of swimmer's itch than in the past that people can recall. That's a result of, of algae in the lake. There is a dead zone in the lake, a uh, very, very low dissolved oxygen area that shouldn't be there. Um, that impacts you know, movement of fish. Uh, there are regulatory water quality issues. You know, you know, this, the lake was listed as impaired by the DNR in 2014, which triggers a whole bunch of activities that, supposed, that are supposed to take place. The dissolved oxygen is in that dead zone is below the standard that it should be. The phosphorus concentration is too high. And the Green Lake is included in the Upper Fox Wolf total maximum daily load program. So we are part of a, of a regulatory program to deal with nutrient loading in the whole Fox River watershed. Um, so you know, Green Lake is, is being regulated. Let me move us over here again. So, Going through that process for Green Lake, Green Lake is, is classified as a two-story lake, cold water fishery and warm water fishery. The standard is to achieve that fishable, swimmable goal. And the numeric standards that will bring about that goal are more than five milligrams per liter of dissolved oxygen throughout the lake and less than 15 micrograms per liter of phosphorus as a water concentration. When the lake has been monitored, it's been determined that there is this dead zone, which has low dissolved oxygen, and the phosphorus concentration is above that standard. 
That means we're impaired for low dissolved oxygen because of phosphorus. The next step in the process is to develop a plan to deal with that. We're part of the upper Fox Wolf TMDL. Um, I don't know that a separate TMDL plan will be prepared for Green Lake, but we are developing lake management plans. There was one developed in 2013 that's being revised. It's called a nine key elements plan because it incorporates additional federal requirements in it. So Green Lake is going through that regulatory process right now. <clears throat> okay. In looking at the, <clears throat> excuse me, the lake management plan, <clears throat> need a drink for my Green Lake. Green Lake water bottle here. <clears throat> um, the, the lake management plan that was approved in 2013 encompasses a program. And this program is made up of various elements. And these elements are fairly generic to any environmental program. You've got in the center here, you've got the, the, the team, the partners with program management type functions. First thing that, that the program does is <clears throat> identifies the problem. Without a problem, you don't need a program. So what is the problem? What are, we, what are we going to need to address? Then you're going to be doing studies and conducting research to understand the problem and what can be done about it. You develop projects to do something about it. <clears throat> you need resources to implement those projects, so you go get resources. You implement the projects and you evaluate their effectiveness. And this whole process is producing large amounts of information. And I've made this a separate color for a reason because I get, I'm going to get into that a little bit more later. It's a very important issue. And then there's part of the program element is to inform and educate. Now, this program is also implemented in a framework of laws and regulations and a stakeholder community, the stakeholders that, that care about the problem that needs to be addressed. And that's why this inform and educate component of that program is so important to make sure the stakeholders understand what's going on and can be informed, educated decision makers when called upon to make decisions. <clears throat> okay, what does that partnership group look like? Well, it's made up of federal, state, county, and municipal agencies, not-for-profits, and the sanitary district. And in the case of Green Lake, there's a fairly extensive network of universities, learning institutes, that have been brought into what's going on with Green Lake that are available to that management team to better understand what's going on, to do research, to, to answer questions. <clears throat> now, within that group of partners, we've got the non-for-profits, so it'll be the GLA and the Conservancy, the cities, Green Lake and Ripon, the Sanitary District is involved, the federal agencies are the US Geologic Survey and the National Resource Conservation Service, the state agencies are the Wisconsin DNR, of course, and the Wisconsin Department of Agricultural Raid and consumer protection, I believe it is. <clears throat> and of course, you have the counties. You have the two conservation departments in the counties that are the watershed is primarily located in Green Lake County and Fond du Lac County. And these are all partners all, of that team, that lake management planning team that's looking to solve the lake's problems. <clears throat> now, the process is, is a circular process, it's an ongoing, continuous process, driven again by laws and regulations, you know, develop study plans, perform studies develop an action plan based on what that study says, take the actions, and very important to evaluate the effectiveness of those actions, and then do it again. And you keep doing this process as you're working through the problem, taking, biting off you know, small chunks of the problem as you can, working through this process to solve the problem in total. <clears throat> There's been a lot of studies going on in Green Lake. Um, in fact, it's probably one of the most studied water bodies in the state. Um, <clears throat> I went to a website and I found environmental studies going back to 1891 on Green Lake. Um, the US Geologic Survey has been sampling Green Lake since 2004. That's an ongoing process. There was a uh, stream assessment done that cataloged the condition of several streams in the watershed, uh, identifying serious sources of erosion, serious problems that needed to be fixed. And that formed the basis for a lot of our watershed projects that have been performed to date. Uh, it does need to be updated because this is a an ongoing issue. Um, it's a dynamic. You know, nature's dynamic. Those those conditions are changing, so these types of studies need to be updated on a regular basis. <clears throat> uh, the Nelson Institute, one of our um, educational partners, if you will, <clears throat> has performed studies of the 
Silver Creek Estuary, the County K Marsh to, to give us information about how they're functioning and what might need to be done to improve them and make them more part of an eco resilient part of the watershed. Um, also looking at where is the phosphorus, legacy phosphorus stored in the lake? Where is it, or the lake in the watershed? Where is it um, most prevalent? So we can focus our efforts to, to deal with it. <clears throat> um, just being completed recently is a very, very detailed study that was performed by the Geologic Survey and Michigan Tech University to look at what's causing that low dissolved oxygen zone, that dead zone in the lake and come up with, with some recommendations for what we can do about it. That report should be coming out probably within a few months. And then I also wanna talk about the, uh, <clears throat> the County K pilot project. Um, <clears throat> this was installed by the sanitary district, I think last, last April, about a year ago. This was an effort to see if, if we can um, promote the development of a better type of, of plant life, or plant structures that bind up the sediments and keep the sediments from moving through and carrying nutrients with them. So it's a pilot project. We want to see if it's going to work. And if it does, then we can expand it throughout more parts of the county K Marsh. So there are all kinds of studies that are ongoing. There are also a lot of plans that have been developed dating back to 1984, plans by the DNR. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned the 2013 Lake Management Plan, developed after the team was formed, establishing the short and long-term water quality objectives. And that long-term water quality objective is to return the lake to an oligotrophic state. Um, the county conservation departments have 10-year plans, which lays out their objectives for protecting water quality in, within their counties. Uh, DNR prepared a plan in 2017, which summarized the conditions of the watershed at that time and offered specific recommendations. And right now under development is this nine key elements plan, which is an update to that 2013 plan, but with more of a focus on phosphorus reduction studies and actions. And that plan will be approved by, hopefully by the DNR and EPA. And what's important about some of these plans, like the nine key elements plan, the lake management plan, is to be eligible for grant funds for many of these projects, you have to have an approved plan. So we wanna have these plans in place so that when we apply for grants to do work in the watershed, we check that box. Otherwise, you're not eligible for those grants. <clears throat> but we don't just study and plan, we're also taking actions. Um, in this diagram, what, what it illustrates is the two types of actions. We're taking mitigation and adaption, adapting actions. Um, things like getting rid of the carp, um, weed harvesting, those are mitigation activities. They don't deal with the symptoms, but they, or they deal with the symptoms, but they don't deal with the cause. And their function is to make the lake more enjoyable now while we're doing the restoration and preservation function for actions. Uh, and those include things like best management practices being installed in the watershed, stream bank restoration. And the goal of those actions is again, to reverse that decline, that oligotrophic, uh, to mesotrophic, to eutrophic trend around to go back to an oligotrophic state. You can see that the years on there are 2020 and 2070. This is a long-term undertaking we're doing. Um, how did that happen? There we go, there we go, okay. <clears throat> I talked a little bit about what those actions are. For adapting to conditions, basically what we're saying is an individual has to modify their lake use based on information. So if there's a lot of swimmers itch being reported in Norwegian Bay, let people know, don't go swimming in Norwegian Bay. That's adapting, changing how you use certain parts of the lake. Um, mitigation is treating with the symptoms, carp removal and weed harvesting. Restoration is restore, that restore part of the Clean Water Act. And this includes best management practices being installed in the watershed, stream bank restoration, and to be studied, to be determined is, is there something that we should be doing in the lake itself? <clears throat> Preservation, that's the maintain part of the Clean Water Act. Stream bank restoration is also a preservation because that adds to the eco resiliency of the watershed as does wetland restoration. Right now, the Silver Creek Estuary not functioning as well as it should as a wetland, but the data suggests when we measure what's coming into the estuary in terms of phosphorus, and what's going under the County A bridge, more is coming into the estuary than is going under the bridge. That means that some of it is being captured in the estuary. So it is functioning 
Not as well as it could be, but it's still functioning to reduce pollution loading. County K Marsh, there's more coming out than going in. The, the County K Marsh is acting as a source of, of nutrient pollution to the lake. We need to work on restoring the County K Marsh so it becomes a filter once again. And then there's a whole need for behavior changes that cumulative impact I talked about. You need to have behavioral changes for long-term preservation to maintain Green Lake's water quality. And the whole goal of all these actions, again, is to achieve that recreation standard. Okay. Um, the pollution equation that I showed before, the pollution sources, what we're doing in the watershed with the pollution sources is a containment function. The best management practices are designed to contain the nutrients in place. What we're doing in the migration pathway is stream restoration or wetlands restoration and some water diversion to keep the water from getting, the pollution from getting to the lake. What we're doing in the receptor, the water bodies, we're doing those adapt and mitigate actions and actions to be deterred. Okay, I wanna to jump to the information management piece of this. And there's two parts of information management. And again, this, this is widespread throughout all environmental programs. Um, that's why I wanna spend some time on it. Information, when we're talking about reliable information and available information, both key elements. When I talk about reliable information, um, data and information is used to make decisions and it needs to be reliable. So when you're going to be collecting data, there has to be very clear objectives as to what that data is supposed to be used, is going to be used for. There's a difference between making a decision about whether something is present or is it at a concentration that is harmful. So you need to understand the objective. And then you have to develop a rigorous quality control process to make sure that that data you're collecting is good data. You, you identify your data needs, you collect the data, you analyze the data within the construct of a quality control process, then you can trust the data for decision making. But just reliable data isn't enough. The data also has to be available. Data, you can have all the data in the world, but if it really isn't available to be used, it never becomes information. And you need information to gain knowledge so you can make smart decisions. So information management is a huge, huge piece of an environmental program. Now, <clears throat> the Green Lake Association has partnered with the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies to develop and maintain an information management system that's available to the public. Uh, the system does need to be updated and the GLA has established this as a priority. Uh, they want to be able to use and maintain the system so it's available for all the stakeholders to go learn more about what's going on with the lake in as much detail as you would want to learn. Um, <clears throat> so that, yeah, that's a process underway. But in summary, Green Lake system, the lake and the watershed make up a system. It's complex and it's dynamic. Nature tends to be a dynamic creature. Uh, this dynamic nature requires us to to engage in continuous learning, um, continuous evaluation and making adjustments to the program as we learn. Solutions are generational. This, is, this took a while to get to the state where it's in. It's gonna take a while to fix it. And people need to understand that this isn't a quick fix type of a program. Green Lake is a unique lake. It's the deepest internal lake in Wisconsin. It has a lot of unique features. But what I hope I've showed you is that the problems that Green Lake is facing aren't unique to Green Lake. There's a lot of research, a lot of studies, a lot of efforts underway to solve the problem of over nutrient, the nutrient loading and, and this advanced eutrophication. And so there's a lot that we can learn from others. And, but because of Green Lake's uniqueness, maybe there's things that we'll be able to share with others as we learn how to solve our problems. Stakeholder engagement and education is critical in this process. Um, and hopefully I've provided you with, with some level of education tonight, uh, but more importantly, I hope I've sparked a little bit of interest on your part to learn more like I did when I took that class back in 1969. There's so much good educational information out there about what's going on in Green Lake. Um, I encourage people to, to look at it, to learn, to become more educated about what's going on. There's so much more out there than when I started back in, in 1969. Um, so take advantage of what's out there to become better educated. So with that, open to questions. Okay. Um, uh, I've got a couple from our chat page. 
Um, Jolene Schatzinger asks, uh, grateful for this presentation question, has there been conversation about lowering the water level back down to encourage marsh wetlands to be revived? <clears throat> Would that be a smart option to look at? Um, whenever you're, you're selecting a response action, there's different things you, you look at in coming up with that, with, with whether something can be done. You look at technical feasibility, cost, but you also look at social acceptance. Would it be socially acceptable to lower the lake level by four or five feet? Would that be acceptable to the folks who have their houses over on the Silver Creek estuary? Would that be acceptable to the folks in the terrace or in Byers Cove? So those places would, they wouldn't have lakefront property anymore. Um, so when you're thinking about feasibility, you have to also look at social acceptability. Um, I don't think that that would be socially acceptable. And then we have a question from Alex Dahlman. Um, do you have any examples of the lakes around Wisconsin or in neighboring states that have been able to successfully move the lake back to the holotrophic stage? I'd like to know if our regulations work, if implemented, and or if they are keeping up with human activity. I'm not aware of a state that's been, that's reversed to an oligotrophic stake in the area. I haven't done a lot of research as that's happened, but I certainly haven't read anything in the research that I've done. Um, are the regulations sufficient? That's to be determined. And, and the reason I say that is um, we haven't fully implemented the regulations that we have. I'll tell you one, one concern I have is, um, is with invasive species. I believe the regulations when they were developed on water quality standards were, were developed based on the science of water quality, not taking into account, into account the potential impact of invasive species. Um, what happens if we meet the water quality standard, but because of zebra mussels that take in phosphorus from the water as they grow, but then when they die or when they excrete their waste, which they do, they're doing it in a shallow water so are they relocating phosphorus to a different part of the lake where it could have a different impact? So is that, that's something that, again, is on our, our list of things to study. And I don't know that the regulations have taken something like that into account. Hopefully that answers the question. It's, you know, I don't have, haven't, haven't yes, seen I could unmute. I could unmute here and, and allow, um, hmm. While Rich is working on that, I kind of just want to follow up on that, on my question. Uh, thank you once again for putting this on. I learned a lot. Um, I was trying to learn more about how we can um, better help our water quality around the state. Um, but the, the thing I worry about is that people don't have um, something that they can look at um, to see if this is, if this is the, the restrictions that we're willing to take on, or if we're willing to take on these regulations, this is what we can get to. Um, so the hardest part for me to wrap my head around all of it is we're going to do all of this and make, and, and, um, force everybody to adapt to certain certain different things in order to, re, to get to a conclusion um, that we don't know is even possible um, because we can't see it um, in another in another um, example. Um, but I understand. I mean, I, I am fully on board with doing all that, but I just want to know from your perspective, what can we do to better educate the public on um, taking all this and and for a, for a greater cause, but we don't I mean, I don't know if you know what I'm, what I'm saying here. No, I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, it's, it's a situation that I faced in my career. Um, when you're undertaking an activity at, at a point in time and you're not gonna see the result for 20 or 25 years. And how do you know that you're gonna get that result when you're in year two or three? Um, all I can say is that having been in the business for 45 years, I have seen positive results after those 20, 25 years of things done back then. And when I look at the activities that are being done now to deal with the nutrient essence of nutrient loading, they all make sense to me. Um, what's compounding the issue is the rate at which, at which we can do it. You know, there are, there are constraints. There, you know, there's, there's economics, there's capacity, resources, there are constraints to how fast things can be done. And we're also working in a dynamic environment with, with heavier rainfalls and things like that. So 
there's a lot of moving parts to it, but personally, professionally, I have confidence that the, the right things are being done. It probably needs to be accelerated. And I'm just not sure if the capacity is there right now to accelerate. That, that's my personal opinion. Thank you very much. There, there's a, a rather long question that came from uh, Kurt in asking about uh, the impact of uh, dog waste and, um, and, and various options. I guess, Kurt, can you unmute and, and summarize this for us? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Well, the, the basic thing is, is it looked to me like, you know, the, the, the big issue is, you know, talking about dog poop. And I can understand in an urban environment where that would really be a big issue. Nobody wants dog poop in parks. They have to pick it up after their pets and stuff like that. But the, the bottom line is, if you do the math on the amount of nitrogen and stuff like that, it would take 4,300 pounds of dog poop to equal one lawn application per acre. Of, of fertilizer that nitrogen of the nitrogen rate that is recommended. I don't even know how many times that goes on per year. So, you know, the bottom line is really the amount of fertilizer that is put on and where that goes. I mean, if a dog is in a rural environment, happens to poop or whatever, do we really want all that dog waste go, you know, going into a, a landfill? I agree if it's in a public area, in any area near any storm drains or anything like that, that's legitimate. But it looked to me like dogs are getting a bad rap on this thing and it's not that big of a thing compared to lawn fertilization and you know accepted practices that people actually pay money for. I think that's where the focus really has to go. Yeah. No, I, point, point's well taken. And I, I certainly don't want to put any blame on the dogs for not having their, their stuff picked up. That goes to the dog owner. Um, the point being made there is that the, the cumulative effect of, of, of individual action of doing something or not doing something. And you know, actually dog waste going into a landfill is not a bad thing. Landfills need more organic waste anyway um, to function properly. It's a whole other subject. But yeah, I know I understand your point. Um, the reason I brought up dog waste is that um, we're talking about individuals. You know, what, what can an individual do? I, well, I can't install a best management practice on somebody's farm but I can take care of my yard waste. I can pick up after my dog. I can control the type of fertilizer used. So these are things I can do as an individual. If I'm the only person doing that, is that gonna make an impact on the problem? No, but if everybody does it, yeah, it can have an impact. Yeah, and, and I would agree with that. You know, I, I guess my point was basically, there has to be a lot more focus on um, basic lawn fertilization practices and and the effects of that you know people want a beautiful lawn and all that kind of stuff but there is a cost no question no question about it i agree um okay we have another question from james turbshaw uh and he asks have we considered engaging uw milwaukee school of freshwater science as a member of our partnership team and i don't know the answer to that one yeah, I, I don't either. Um, I, I don't think there's, you know, I, we're not out to exclude anybody, that's for sure. Um, I, right. I don't know, um, you know, a lot of times the, the network you have is because you have a connection and we, that's sort of our network now, but that doesn't mean it can't be expanded. It shouldn't be expanded. Okay, are there any other questions that the audience had? Any other comments? you're interested, just unmute yourself. And otherwise, if not, I guess we're a little bit over time, but not bad. I uh, wanna thank Bill very much for, for his time and effort on, on this. I think it's a really important issue for all, all folks that live in the watershed and are concerned about water issues. I think it, as he indicates, it's more broadly based than just the Green Lake than just Green Lake or just the Green Lake watershed because all of these problems occur in other lakes uh, and other bodies of water. Um, so I thank you, Bill. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, also like to thank the audience for, for your time and, and interest in this subject matter. Any other comments or questions? Well, if not, 
I, I guess we will conclude this and thank you again for your participation. Glad to see you all here. And thanks again, Bill. Very yeah. good. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Yeah. <laughs> Bye now. Bye-bye.